Greetings to everyone. I'm thrilled uh, to present the final uh, lecture in our fall lecture series. And my name is Blaine Brownell. I'm the director of the School of Architecture here at UNC Charlotte. And I'm accompanied in this space by Greer, executive assistant, and uh, Emily Makash. And Emily and her students are attending uh, here. Uh, they compose the panel that will uh, ask our lecture questions and engage in discussion at the end of her presentation. I am so excited to have Zena Howard uh, speak with us today. Where I've been looking forward to this all semester. Uh, Zena is the principal and managing director of the North Carolina practice of global architecture and design firm Perkins and Will. An award-winning architect, strategist, mentor, and team builder. She is known for her success leading visionary, complex, and culturally significant projects, including the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., the International Civil Rights Center and Museum in Greensboro, and Brooklyn Village here in Charlotte. There are many more projects that, that she'll share with us today. Through her work with private and public institutions, Howard engages disenfranchised stakeholders, unites disparate parties, and infuses cultural meaning into all of her projects. A native of North Carolina, Howard earned her undergraduate degree in architecture from the University of Virginia. She is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, a lead accredited professional, and a member of the National Organization of Minority Architects. Please join me in welcoming Zena Howard. Thank you so much, Blaine. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. It's great to be here uh, to speak with you all today. I just realized uh, when that I'm the last one, so I hope not to disappoint. I know it's, no, it's tough. I'm sure I have uh, many tough acts to follow here. I understand it's been a good lecture series for you guys this year, so. Um, Happy to be here. Uh, what I want to talk to you to, about today is a little bit about our cultural practice. And I want to also um, say that a lot of our Charlotte studio, we have uh, 25 people roughly in Charlotte. And I know a lot of them are probably uh, watching um, this series today. Uh, and I want to just give a shout out to them because a lot of this work is a result of the great team that we have um, in our Charlotte and Durham, North Carolina studios. So in talking about um, culture, I am a, uh, obviously a principal managing director, but also a cultural practice leader in, in the firm. Um, and I sort of come from a legacy of doing cultural work really is defined by, you know, particular building typology, but um, we're expanding that uh, in North Carolina in our practice to really think of culture, um, not just um, in the, in the uh, framework of museums and libraries and cultural centers, but also thinking about cultural landscapes and infusing them to, into other typologies such as libraries. So today I have a, uh, about a brief uh, amount of time with you. So I'm gonna share a few projects that are legacy projects that demonstrate this. And then a couple that um, are really just, um, you know, we're, where we're beginning to, to look at this notion of cultural landscapes. So my work is really about um, using history as a framework. Um, I believe it can be used to design a more equitable and culturally sustained future. Uh, the work really center around, centers around a belief that critical to our role as designers is ensuring that the creative process really involves community members as collaborators, history as informant, and really promotes economic st uh, stability as fundamental goals of the project. So um, <clears throat> we have been, um, I've been fortunate to, uh, you know, be a part of many buildings around the world, around the country that are considered iconic catalysts. Some of these that I will view with you today. Um, I think that these buildings um, really have a significant impact on the public and they really are part of the built environment that's an expression of our human understanding and collective values. That's what makes them so treasured. But beyond that, 
they do other things. Um, they inspire the, the, the places and spaces around and between them. Um, and these, these in-between spaces, um, you know, led us to this curiosity about, uh, about exploring cultural landscapes. You can see images here from, for instance, our March for Our Lives rally against gun violence or anything from the National Women's March in, in 2017. These, um, these are places that people feel comfortable coming to to, to express. Um, and that, by default, um, creating uh, accessible places, not just handicap accessible, but, but, but culturally accessible spaces is what um, these cultural practice and these projects are about. Also, it's a lot about process. So, you know, you know, I often have defined what I do as an architect. I've, I've described it to some people as the same thing I did when I was a kid, you know, tell stories, draw, and talk to people, you know. And if you think about it in those really simplistic ways, you understand that how you do what we, what we do is very important as to what we actually create. So community discovery and engagement um, is usually, a, is very much about engaging these disenfranchised communities that Blaine talked about when he introduced me and infusing cultural meaning into just about every project that, that we do. Um, it's about telling stories and, and we're gonna talk about why storytelling is as important and how the built environment can express these stories because we believe in our practice that story is as important to a project as site or program. So I'm gonna go through just a few uh, buildings here uh, and a, a project here quickly. One that Blaine just mentioned, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It opened about four years ago on the mall in Washington, DC. And you know, this project started as an international design competition and, and the images that you see here on the screen are some of those conceptual drivers that, that we brought to that, that first kickoff charrette, which was literally um, a few days after President Barack Obama was, uh, was inaugurated as the uh, first African-American president of the United States in 2009. So here we were in Washington, DC, and this project was really a collaboration of four architecture firms uh, and architects. And, uh, you know, it was quite, um, quite, monumental then I don't think before then or since I've ever collaborated with as many architects, but you'll see the power in that and why um, diversity can really drive um, excellent solutions. What you see on the screen to the left are images, the lower left that were taken just a couple of days before on the mall when people were celebrating that historic inauguration. So we were intrigued by the notion and the gestures that people make when they celebrate that uplifting of hands. Um, there are also images down to the lower right of this porch element. And so this notion of a Southern African-American sensibilities and the way that, that that community uses the porch really as a way of a space that um, engages community, but really you know, mitigates outdoor and interior environments. Um, we were intrigued by light and natural light and, and, and how, how that comes to fruition. But most of all, the image that you see to the far right is a, um, is a urban caryatid. It's, it's a figure that's used in, in West African art and architecture. And that form on the top of the caryatid's head is, is, a, is a crown, or we refer to it as a corona. That became very, very important because this is bringing in West African sensibilities and merging them with African American sensibilities was key. So the form of the corona from West Africa. Then we looked to stories from America that had not yet been told that we thought could be put forth in this museum. And here you see an image of uh, the ironwork that was done by many most of that iron work in the southern parts of the state in Savannah, um, Charleston, New Orleans, were done by African-American craftsmen. And this was a story that a lot of people didn't know. And we thought that the museum, a national museum and, and its prominence 
is a wonderful way to pull that story forward. So looking at how we can bring that story and extract it really in a, in a way that's modern and fresh and relevant and, and appropriate for the time that we're in and really merging these all together, the notion of the form of the corona, um, I'll talk about the color of the corona in a minute, um, the, the lacy filigree that the, the um, ironwork gives and modulating light to privileged views and also to, um, to provide uh, shade and, and solar sustenance. Thinking about color, you know, this, it was really important to say, okay, this is a, this is a museum for African-Americans that, you know, very often, um, you know, is about color and, and the hues of, and the color range of African-Americans is quite extensive. So the building, this is the same building in different types, types of light, whether it's direct sunlight, dusk, moonlight, or artificial light can look very different and express itself um, in a way uh, that, that we think really um, reflects the diversity and color in, in the African-American race. And finally, you know, also at the same time, always honoring our place on the mall. And so, you know, the, the exact tilt of the, the corona angle actually matches the capstone of the Washington Monument. So we always wanted to be respectful of that place and time. So that's one way in which, you know, a, a building came together to express stories and cultural values of, of corona form, uh, shape, porch, light um, in, in a very, very uh, clean um, expression that's very respectful on, on the mall. This notion of porch um, of, uh, you know, I mentioned that was used by Southern, um, mostly African Americans. We took an exaggerated, you know, approach of that porch, doing a really a, a 180 foot clear cantilever, um, you know, coming out uh, over 60 feet over this water. Water was another story we wanted to pull forward. Um, it's one that is very central to the African American story. Most African Americans got to this country by crossing water. On the interior of the building, we used water in a different way, a vertical uh, way, moving way, uh, metaphorically to, to underscore the fact of, of this wonderful Martin Luther King quote, that justice is always flowing, it's always moving, and um, it's something that is always, uh, uh, you always have to strive for. It, you can never take for granted that it just happens. You have to be very deliberate. And so, uh, Again, in the final image here, you see the porch now uh, ma uh, married with the corona and of course the light and, and the uplifting crowning form that, that embraces the content above you as you enter. So, you know, we were talking earlier, I know you guys are obviously know the Gantt Center and this was an early project. This was an early, by the way, my predecessor, Phil Freelon, um, you know, had a, a wonderful uh, 15 year uh, for 15 years, worked with him. Uh, we're just very proud to be uh, his partner. And I think most of you know, Phil Freelon died last year, passed, and so, um, but his legacy and these wonderful buildings uh, lives on. So um, I worked with Phil on this project. This is the uh, Harvey Gantt Center. Um, I think you guys know where it is, but you may or may not know the story behind it. And so this was um, working with the AACC, for quite a long time to find a site for, for this new center at the time, the cultural center. And um, the city, uh, you know, had offered this site, which at the time, um, you know, our client was a bit taken aback because it appeared as a remnant site. It's very oddly proportioned, you know, 50 or just over 50 feet wide and over, um, you know, uh, 400 feet long. Um, very odd, like how do you put a building on, what do you do with it? And it was really just the site that accesses the tunnel at that time um, for the new tower that they were building, which was at Wachovia at the time. Um, now it's Bank of America, I think. Uh, so it really was a, you know, what, what do we do with this site? But we were intrigued because it has a wonderful location. 
obviously. It's right there in the cultural district near the Mint, the Beckler. NASCAR is not too far away. So we thought we need to explore this um, because I don't think, uh, you know, we're going to get a better location. What was intriguing to us is that um, nearby in Brooklyn Village, and Blaine mentioned this as well, was a school and a, a, a beloved school in a community that was destroyed um, by, by urban renewal. And so this Brooklyn Village uh, community during its time in the 60s was, was about as, as, as progressive and wealthy and affluent as you can get to, with being an African-American community at that time. They owned everything, their own banks, their own um, uh, financial institutions. So, but they had the school here and there was one edifice that was really prominent on the school that everyone, you know, sort of came around and, and took their graduation pictures every year. And it was called Jacob's Ladder. And so we thought a lot about Jacob's Ladder. And we also thought about the stories of quilting and weaving um, the symbology of, of what that meant, um, how it was, uh, yes, it was very practical reasons to quilt and weave, but quilting and weaving was also messaging, right? It was a way of communication subtly for, um, for enslaved uh, African Americans. So bringing this notion of Jacob's Ladder uh, and then the lifting up of this building together with the weaving, we sort of conceived of this quilted uh, skin pattern that you see here on, on the building that really reflects that beloved community and this, this skill of, of quilting. And um, I know there's a, obviously we're gonna lose this view because I believe there's a um, uh, construction that's gonna uh, abut this, but thinking also about the backside of the building at that time, even though it was a zero lot line and how we could um, make that just as, as powerful. And this view we have lost, but because this was the, the community that destroyed the, um, the African-American, this was the, taken from the, the uh, path, overpass that destroyed the African-American community, Brooklyn Village, um, um, by way of, um, you know, of uh, urban renewal some 40 or 50 years ago. So this image of the, the project with the backdrop of the city is, is um, pretty powerful. Uh, the next one is in Atlanta, not too far from Charlotte, but the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. And uh, this is on the Coca-Cola Plaza in Atlanta, next near the aquarium, if, if any of you go there. So this was a broader story. This was about human rights worldwide. And we know that the struggle, um, you know, you, you find it obviously here in America, but here are pictures from, from the Arab Spring. And really, at the time, when we were thinking about the design of this building, um, you know, the Arab Spring was in, in full effect. So thinking about a, a, a place of action or something that can, can, can allow a place for action, um, inspired by what people do when they march um, for, for human rights or civil rights, uh, the, the interlocking arms and the gestures that they make and, and, and what in the spaces between those, what that means. And so just conceiving of just two walls, simple walls um, that embrace the content and float in the middle of, of the Coca-Cola Plaza, we thought about these walls and once again, thinking about diversity at every end, thinking about how diverse people are in scale, in size, in color, um, in perspective. And so really putting forth a, a, a tapestry sort of uh, expression on the exterior of, of these canted walls um, that really, really stand in, in contrast to, to the city. Bringing in color again, thinking about the diversity of, of color and tonality and texture. Um, also pulling in public art, that's really, really important and that's a huge component in a, in a lot of our work. And um, finally, uh, this is the last built project I'm gonna show you. Then I have a couple more to show you that are, um, that are uh, landscapes. This is uh, 
a project that we're currently working on, and a couple people in the Charlotte studio are working on, on this as well. Uh, this is um, the Motown Museum expansion. This is another story that, you know, we sit back and I've shown you projects from trying to, trying to pull forth stories from a whole race of people, African-Americans, trying to tell the story of one community, Brooklyn Village in one area, then finally zooming back out, trying to tell stories of human rights worldwide. And this one, trying to tell a story of really what literally was the music that changed America. Um, and so this story is sort of told, there are three, there are four aspects that made Motown what it was. And I always say it's four ingredients. And without any one of those, I really don't think we would have Motown in the way that we have it today. And so it starts with, um, with obviously Barry Gordy. There's Barry Gordy there uh, as a young man who, um, as he was working on the assembly lines for one of the big four auto manufacturers, envisioned that he could make um, music uh, in his head. And so he began to think of beats and, and he thought about the beats against the rhythm, you know, the consistent rhythm of the, the machinery on the assembly lines. But prior to Barry Gordy, he came from a really structured family unit that really instilled in him the notion that, that things can be possible. So it really started with his family, then to Barry Gordy, um, then to a city, Detroit at the time, that was part of the second migration, which was when African-Americans were migrating from the South to the North to escape um, you know, the harsh, um, largely the Jim Crow era of the South. Detroit was a city of opportunity. And um, so that city uh, allowed uh, Barry Gordy and others to, to explore and create there was a house called Hitsville House, um, Hitsville, USA. And Barry Gordy purchased that house on West Grand Boulevard because it was the only house on, on, in that area he could find that had a detached garage that he called Studio A. And all of the Motown um, original music and soundtrack was made in that, in that studio. And the, the quintessential Motown sound was actually created um, by really piping the music up through the attic space, the A-frame in the attic space, and then really recording off that reverberation sound from the attic. So uh, it's quite interesting that all the major uh, music companies tried to recreate, figure out a way to recreate that Motown sound that we all know, that classic sound, but it was really a result of the architecture of the home uh, that provided that sound. And so we thought about how you then think about telling this story. And so at the moment, um, when we were thinking about this, we thought about all of the Motown hits, their top hits. And we, we actually color mapped those, those hits. Um, and we thought about, you know, we don't, no one does this anymore, but we thought about what it looks, used to look like when you had album covers or even CDs on a record shelf. Um, but we also thought, yeah, that represents what Motown was about, but we also thought the building needs its soul. And so at the moment, there was a, a song uh, that Motown put out by Marvin Gaye called What's Going On. And that sound, that song, if you ever listen to it, it resonates today, it's timeless, just as much as it did when, when um, it was made. And so we took the notion of, of you know, that, that beat, that main refrain from what's going on, and we sound mapped that and just really put um, a soul and a beat behind these fins of the, of the record cover to really give the building a feeling of, of movement. And so this is just thinking about, yes, in some ways when you have a story that's so large, um, there is oftentimes, um, a, a story that, that resonates with most, in this case, Marvin Gaye's song that, that you can kind of hang your, your hat on. And um, really stepping the building back, being respectful of Hitsville, USA, which is historic. And also Barry Gordy purchased the three homes um, you see to the left. So all of that is the Motown campus. So we really wanted the new addition to be a, a, a backdrop and not upstage that in any way. 
So that kind of takes you through, uh, you know, some buildings and how you can begin to think about culture um, and, and why it's important. Uh, that led us, uh, you know, about four years ago, I started thinking about, you know, uh, the, you know, bringing this out that that the consumption of culture should not be behind, you know, memberships, museum memberships, and and um, you know, passes and ticketing. You know, how can we think about um, just exposing people and make ev making everyday life a more robust experience? So um, we trademarked this notion of remembrance design, and it's really important and it's really a tenant of our of our practice, not just our cultural practice, but our entire practice now in um, North Carolina as we think about how everything we do from from libraries to healthcare projects to um, uh, workplace can can infuse um, remembrance. And it's really about um, creating and preserving identity and as a way to make um, great spaces. And it's what makes it um, effective, I guess is the word, is that it's really thinking about places and, and how their contexts relate to them. Um, and really understanding that um, that con firm, places firmly rooted, rooted in their context will sustain in a way uh, that's uh, a lot more than we can imagine culturally. So it's a process. It really is a process um, that engages uh, negatively impacted communities, and it really uses history as a framework to design a, uh, a more inclusive future going forward. Um, and it's also a way to al allow communities to reconcile with their past while also, you know, planning around a shared uh, forward looking future. So we believe that this design approach, um, there, there are certain things that it does. We, it involves expanding collaborations and partnerships. So um, we as designers no longer think of ourselves as um, designing in silos or echo chambers. We're expanding partnerships and relationships to bring in historians, politicians, anthropologists, futurists uh, to help us um, think broader and to be able to, to engage um, with people more, more, um, more broadly. And so we, we do that. It's about looking at urban areas and really leveraging cultural assets. Every area has assets that the community loves and they protect, even if, if from the outside, they don't look like much to us. And it's about um, leading with culture in places that are rapidly gentrifying, rapidly changing, and then um, taking the attitude that all projects can be opportunities to mend physical or social rifts. So I'm going to walk you through two last two projects, um, and uh, one at a very, very small scale and one at a much bigger scale. So here in North Carolina in, in Greenville, uh, this is about um, remembering a, a community called Sycamore Hill. Uh, this is a historic photo of Greenville, and this is the area along the riverside that used to be um, a, a really robust community. They, um, you can see on the upper left photo, these, these were homes uh, that people lived in and they really had a, a belief, a strong belief in, uh, in community and in education in um, a strong spiritual and religious belief. And everyone in that community, everyone went to this church called Sycamore Hill Missionary Baptist Church that was on the corner. And this community was so very proud of this church because it recognized, uh, you know, it represented to them sort of a rival. So what happened to this community? Well, once again, just removed through urban renewal efforts um, there were efforts to to try to keep the church, um, and you can see on this image where the where the road kind of routes around the church, but it later fell to what is presumed to be um, arson, and so the city now um, is coming back and doing a wonderful uh, um, 
you know, um, urban amenity space. They're, they're creating this whole area now into a parkland and, and it just sat vacant after they destroyed this community. And now they're doing something great. But when it came to this corner where the church was, this 1.1 acre, uh, there was a lot of discussion about how should that church be com uh, commemorated. Well, through deep kind of engagement and, 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 and discussions, we, we understood that there were some prevailing themes and emotions really from this community. They, they were proud. Um, that was one that stood out. The spirituality, the music, um, everyone talked about the music that you would hear from that church on a Sunday, just standing outside of it, not even going in on a Sunday morning. And finally, um, the prominence. They, these were all things that they missed as a, as a result of this uh, community being destroyed. So we were thinking, how can we reinstill that back in? Thinking of this notion of music that they all talked about and how important it was and, and how it, uh, the church provided structure. But we all know that music is also um, you know, uh, freedom within a framework, within some type of structure. And thinking about the 22 founders, many of which were women that they talked so, so proudly about. Um, also looking at the historical, researching the historical plan of the church and how it laid out on the exact site. And believing that we can bring back these feelings of reflection, gathering, prominence, rejoicing that they lost Obviously, we're not ever going to mimic or try to recreate a, the church there on the site, but we want to create um, the feeling and, and, and the emotions. And so looking at um, how we can take that one acre site and put back some things that, that were lost, our, our interpretation of those things that were lost, um, all the way down to you know the step viewing terrace that they used to uh, use to go down to uh, have baptism at the riverside. And these were our early um, renderings of it and, and looking at how we can bring back that prominence, a tower element, um, and, and the notion of uh, the feeling of stained glass and, and the patterning of the glass represents actually the lot uh, uh, layout of that one point of, of that acre, 1.1 acre, the lots that used to lay um, on the, um, the communities that were adjacent to that 1.1 acre. And so, and this is, um, we actually just got these um, scouting photographs. Uh, this is in process right now, but you can see, you know, just the notion of, of, of trying to bring that back, trying to bring light in and reflection in through the sycamore trees were really important and how, you know, we can begin to, um, to really bring back spirituality and the sense of spirituality that they felt that they lost and, and the nestling in, in the sycamore trees. And so this is the last one that I uh, want to talk about because I want to give time to, for you guys to, to answer some questions. Um, but this is big. So whereas Greenville was 1.1 acres, this is 1.3 miles. And so um, when we were approached by this project, about this project, it was a head scratcher. We, we were told we want to do a 1.3 mile outdoor museum. And it was uh, in South Los Angeles. Um, and in, in the Crenshaw area. And so the notion is that this is a community inspired public art and streetscape design project. And the, the driver behind it is that it absolutely needs to celebrate the world-class contributions of black South Los Angeles. We know that, um, that this, that community has a culture that's really consumed, not just, you know, uh, in the United States, but really worldwide, anything from entertainment to clothing, to car culture, to political culture, to major movements. And so, but those stories just stay there. And the, and the people in that community never really realize the benefit of, of what they create. So this, this project strives to really strategically use an iconic street name to anchor and provide the context for public art and streetscape design. So, but what sparked it was that um, the city decided to run a new metro line, which is very much needed in Los Angeles from, you know, LAX all the way to close to downtown. 
But when they came to this one area of this community, they actually ran the train upgrade, where in other similar communities, they spent the money to tunnel underground or elevate it above ground. So this was really a quite a, a, a bit of a smack in the face for this community that couldn't believe that in this day and age, um, you know, cities are still using infrastructure to divide and tear down uh, communities. And keep in mind that west of the Mississippi, they're not, this is the only, this is the largest intact African-American community anywhere west of the Mississippi that have lived there for generations and generations. There's no other community. So, so this was huge for, for the city. This is the 1.3 miles from 60th to 48th Street. Uh, the, the kind of orange space that you see right there is where the metro would stop. So this is what we started with and what we were faced with. And so through this deep community partnership, engagement, discussions, eating, talking, you know, sleeping and waking up the next day and talking some more, um, we really were able to think about the vision and really making sure that we stuck to the four visions of heritage, uh, leveraging assets, unique experience, and catalyzing growth. It's very much a, a, a project about um, economy, even as much equally important as architecture and landscape architecture. And so we thought about, well, how do we bring all of these forces together? Architecture, interpretive design, art, the metro, landscape. There's a lot of things going on here. And so we decided that at the time I was actually reading this book by Dr. Mindy Fullalove, um, who is a clinical psychiatrist. And she focuses on the way social and environmental factors affect the mental health of communities. And she's also a professor of urban policy and health. And so looking at 400 years of the history of these people, and you know, although things were very overt and and sustained um, like slavery and Jim Crow, but there's still things happening today that um, taken all together have just as much an impact on, on the, the, the trauma. And so in thinking about this notion of root shock that she talks about, that's the name of her book, looking at how, these, how this community even got to Los Angeles to begin with. So we studied you know, the, the, the forced a global slave migration, which we know the diaspora just about affected every continent on the planet. We also looked at the two major migrations of African Americans in the United States, the first from south to north, and then the latter one, which speaks to uh, California, was from south to west, and understanding how this community got to this Crenshaw area to begin with. And the, the dark blue represents um, the changes over certainly over the past uh, 60, 70 years. We have a new census that's gonna come out next year, but you can see how the community has just kind of consolidated up and down that Crenshaw uh, uh, line that runs north south in that blue area. And so we started thinking about, it's an amazing story that this that there are not a whole lot of African Americans in the United States that can say my family has lived in this area for generations and generations and generations. So this is an amazing story that needs to be um, protected. So metaphorically in studio, we thought about what story or what can, can, can represent this best. And so we started studying um, the giant star grass of the African diaspora, which was a, a grass that was used um, in, the, uh, in the native savanna of Africa. It's actually a rhizome, a, a grass that really has a, a very shallow but robust root system. And um, it's really, in the United States, it's known as Bermuda grass. And, uh, but across the world, you know, it, it's, it's um, it's called different things. So this notion that it started in Africa, it should have died there because it was native there, because it was just transported across the planet as, as bedding hay. Um, but it didn't, it took root, it, it thrived, it grew, it defied what we thought it should do. So we thought metaphorically, this really represented what has happened in, um, 
Los Angeles. And so this notion of, of, of encouraging this community to, to continue to grow where you're planted and spread like this rhizome and, and take root and lead with culture. We know that major forces are happening in a metro line that usually brings gentrification, that usually leads to mass um, displacement. All these things are coming, they're gonna happen. How can we um, make a mark here on this community? So we view this whole 1.3 mile experience through four lenses that we thought rep really represented um, the community. And this, again, was in concert with the community. So this notion of improvisation or the resourcefulness that is really a positive outcome of struggle um, was the first lens. And then the second one was first. These are the first stories of political moments, historical facts, um, anything from the personal to the, po po the political, from the local to the international. Dreams, um, and dreams are what might be conceived, what can be imagined to be attained. And finally, terminating the experience on this notion of togetherness that talks about resilience that is really a result of togetherness and what happens when people come together in everyday life to celebrate, to mourn, to resist, to worship. And so curating the experience around these, these three lenses was, was really um, important to us. And so the result is we're creating the largest um, outdoor experience that will be dedicated to African-American art and culture. And really it's about inserting new street, streetscapes, exhibits, major art installations, pocket parks, small places and large places for entertainment. We thought that the experience needs to have a voice. It needs to be unapologetically black. It needs to be bold, uplifting, diverse, and inclusive. This idea of, of unifying it needs to feel like the 1.3 miles is unified as, as a place. So we thought of how can we use this notion of the rhizome that continues to grow always in, the, in one direction, in two directions from north to south, um, um, from south to north or south to west. And so looking at connective tissues, we're using shade canopies um, that, that help, that are inspired by the rhizome design, um, murals and plaques, inlays. And this isn't just um, thinking about, you know, how the expression is made. We're looking at um, illustrations of historical figures and moments that take on a black LA aesthetic. So really using illustrators from the community to represent historical figures in the way that they see them rather than pulling out sort of old black and white photographs. Um, you thinking about creating a unique graphic pattern with, um, with local weavers there and quilters from the community and seeing how that can come together to brand uh, this 1.3 mile boulevard in a holistic way, looking at storytelling and interpretive panels and how that branding um, can, can read all the way through and help with the connective tissues all the way down the, to the inlays of stories in the rhizome um, pavers uh, that, that we're, we're showing there. This is also a project about environmental equity. In 2012, the city of Los Angeles moved the space shuttle Endeavor to its final resting home in the California Science Center. As a result of that, it, it took down every single tree. You stand on the boulevard, there's not a single tree and they never put it back, put any trees back. So this is about reforestation and bringing back equity in the environment by bringing in a mixture of California natives and. Afrocentric palettes. It's about infusing the space with over uh, hundreds of 2D and 3D public art. We have 10 signature commissions that will be from the top artists um, in America, um, large um, sculptural commissions that are, that are going largely in one area. And um, I'll briefly just kind of show you through these last two things, improvisation uh, is a park that um, that is 
you know, will be marked by a signature 120 foot uh, Crenshaw sign that's a collaboration of, of the design team and, and local artists. Um, yes, the, the, the goal was to see it from an airplane. That, that was one of the, the, the markers. Bringing in uh, public art, you can see here an interpretive piece that's underway by an artist, um, as well as other, there, there's an interpretive piece there to the left, the I am structure. And finally, looking at dreams, this notion of, I talked about using community assets already there. And so looking at this wall, this, this wall is very, very precious to them. It's been in this community for generations. It's had several iterations of mural art. So looking at how we, um, we activate that and make it a special place, particularly um, so that it's viewed properly uh, for the community. And finally, togetherness. This was inspired by a community member during one of our, our sessions that, that really stood up and held up a Sankofa. And a Sankofa is an African term that means really remembering your past in order to protect your future or looking back. So that inspired the design of this entire signature park here for us and the way she told the story about what that meant, not only to the African American community, but her personally and her family um, was huge. So really elevating a platform called Sankofa um, that holds this, this community art, a place that allows you to celebrate this notion of togetherness, to gather, but also lift up um, and look back down the boulevard from where you came from. Um, having a place to engage, of course, uh, watch the events that are there, looking back down the boulevard in, in shaded, uh, bringing in again some of the, the, the landscape, the Afrocentric patterning, and then looking back um, to, towards the other end, past the historic Vision, C Vision Theater sign, and on a clear day, all the way to the Hollywood Hill sign. And so this idea of, of uplift memory, looking back, turning back on the community, this whole notion of Sankofa really underscores Dr. Fully Love's quote about transforming a neighborhood with love. If you stayed and invest um, all time and money, that would make a difference. So um, thank you. Appreciate it. I would love to uh, take any questions. Sorry, I can't see anyone. So I'm flying blind, I guess. <laughs> Dina, thank you so much. Uh, such an inspiring lecture. And I think Sankofa summarizes and embodies uh, our moment of opportunity in so many ways now. I'm going to uh, hand this, hand the uh, microphone, so to speak, over to the students. Uh, Emily, Emily will rejoin us when she can. Uh, Emily Makash had to jump out for an, for an urgent matter, but uh, hopes to rejoin. But in the meantime, I'm going to hand it over to Greer uh, to moderate the student questions. Sure. And thank you again for sharing your perspective on your work, it was really wonderful to see. So um, we have a panel of students who have been reading about you and exploring your work, and they've prepared some questions. So we're going to let each student introduce themselves um, when they ask their questions. Um, but Emily had also made a note that um, she wanted to make sure that you knew this group of students is working with her to research and design an exhibition focused on the work of Phil Freelon, um, whom you worked so closely with for years. And their ex exhibition explores Freelon's design strategies for telling African American stories and celebrating African American identities and culture in the museums, cultural centers, parks libraries and other spaces you all created for those communities. So first up is Fernando. So much for that introduction, Greer. Can everybody hear me well? Yeah. Perfect. My name is Fernando Claudio. I'm a third year dual master's student from the MARC and MSIT program. And one of the questions that I think this, this has actually come up in our discussions for Phil Freelance, like in like we've seen previous lectures that you've given, and you've mentioned that the design process for these projects that you've worked on have long incubation periods. So we wanted to see if you could describe a little bit more about that incubation process, what it is for you and what are some of the steps and why does this process take so long for developing these projects? 
Yeah, thank you, Fernando. I really appreciate the question. Um, these, these types of projects, they do take a long time. And, um, you know, whether it's 10 years, like, as you saw on, on um, the Smithsonian project, uh, Destination Crenshaw so far been on it for, I think, four years. And the reason, one of the reasons why is a couple of things. It takes that long to be really deliberate about engaging um, the, right, the right people. And because if you, if you don't um, do that in these projects, you really end up with something that I always say that kind of peters out, that, that isn't sustained and protected by the community moving forward once we're gone. The other thing is, is, is a very practical reason why, and that's funding, that's fundraising. So all of these projects tend, tend to be fund as you go. And really they're, they're curious projects, right? Because people, you not quite know what it is or like what's destination, what are you talking about? So funders are reticent at first, um, you know, to, to even say, I don't know what this, so it takes a moment to, for people to say, now I get it. And so we've got to get enough design work behind us. We've got to get enough um, momentum going sometimes to get, to get people to really um, open up. And, and so these, these, and all of these projects are funded, even the, the National Museum of African American Com um, History and Culture, that was only uh, half supported by, by federal funds. The other half was all private donors. So those are the main uh, two reasons why. And I would say the last reason, uh, another reason is, um, is the content, the content development. Um, for instance, for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, when we started, we had no content. So it took a while for the Smithsonian to be able to create and to go into the homes of living rooms of many um, African Americans that were sitting on or had in their homes precious uh, artifacts. And um, so it takes a while to develop those things as well. Thank you. And yes, they're very, all these products are very rich in, in content as we've been learning about them and digging deeper into the projects. And we just always keep finding more and more information about even to the last single detail. So thank you. Nick. Hi, I'm Nick Jensen. I'm an undergrad in my final year. Um, so my question in part ties into what you spoke about today, but also what we've read about you and heard in other interviews that you've done. You really stress the importance of cross-disciplinary collaboration in the design process and how that's really important to you. Perkins and Will benefits from its size to be able to employ this kind of interdisciplinary practice. Can you speak a little bit more about what disciplines you think are important to include in the architectural process and why you see this as so important to the practice of architecture? Yeah, that's a good question, Nick. Thanks for the question. Um, so cross-disciplinary, we can look at it in multiple ways, right? Like, yes, within Perkins and Will, within our own practice, we have several disciplines, you know, that, that we can pull upon. We have, you know, workplace strategists, we have people in, in science and technology, um, but that's great. We have research in, within Perkins and Will. And so there, you're right, a, large, a larger firm does benefit by just the, the, the sheer breadth of talent that you're able to pull upon. So that's one way in which we leverage cross-disciplinary approaches. But really the other way is really thinking about bringing in those unusual suspects that I like to call them. It's really um, you know, finding those griots in the communities, those, those uh, community voices um, to partner with. It's really uh, like on Destination Crenshaw, we're partnering with politicians you know, and can you imagine who, that's a strange bed, bedfellows, architects and politicians, right? You, who would have thought? But the power, if architects don't begin to think about, um, you know, politically, uh, you know, financially, how we can make a difference, we're not going to be able to do it without partnering with, with people, with historians, um, with uh, anthropologists that we were talking about that really understand uh, human behavior and, and trends. And so those are the things that really keep architecture um, fresh, relevant, accessible, equitable, and, and, and just. So it, 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 it's, the, it's the 
the uh, interdisciplinary partnerships as well as the partnerships with uh, those kind of strange bedfellows that I call them. Thank you. That was a very nice answer. Thank you. Talia. Hi, I'm a third year undergraduate architecture student. Um, you are a principal and design director of a large firm and have been a lead designer for many years. Have you had any experiences with employees questioning or not trusting your or following your judgment because you're a black woman in position of power? And if so, what advice do you have to overcoming this and gaining the acceptance and trust that you clearly have and deserve? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And um, I'm going to mispronounce your name. Is it Tyla? Thank you. Oh. Tyla. Thank you for asking it. You know, um, so because I've been doing what I've been doing for so long, I've I have a 30 year career now. It has literally, um, I, I can look back now, right? I have enough runway to look back and really see um, how things have, have changed for me over, over the years of my career. And, and early when I first came out, um, and that was in the, you know, that was in the, you know, almost the late eighties. And there was no one that, that, that kind of looked like me or, Nobody. I think. I think at the time I came out of architecture school, there were only 80 um, licensed African American female architects in the country. Today, there's a little over 400, so better. But, um, but it was really difficult. So, at that was a difficult time because people just didn't even think when that they could, you know, kind of see me as an architect because they never seen a black woman as an architect. Today, I think it's different. So the advice I give to to folks is that um, the, what I learned from those early years is to just focus on the work and, and what you love doing. Because those things, it's not that they totally go away, but those barriers tend to break down when people um, get engaged in doing in building something great together. And so you can almost get distracted when somebody looks at you funny or, or you know, kind of questions you, and you know the reason why they're doing it, right? But you kind of have to say that's, you know, that's sort of their problem because I'm going to stay focused. And uh, so that's the advice I give people. It's 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 worked for me, and but I and I know that you know you guys and your generations, you're coming up in a completely different time. The United States was very different 30 years ago, but I do think that that's good advice um, that transcends generations. Thank you so much. That was great. Oh, you're welcome. Emmanuel. Hi, I'm a fourth year undergrad student. Um, you've always been an advocate for diversity and inclusion in the architecture profession and at Perkins and Will. How do you see the built environment perpetuating social injustice? How can we as architects use our profession to contribute to the cause of civil rights? <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. You know, I, I was part of the reason why I do what I do is because in its one, I had this on one of the slides, I, I believe that architecture has the power to address these issues and should. And um, this is not anything new. This is what Whitney Young said when he addressed the AIA, you know, 1968, that that architects have a role. And for, for so long, we we haven't believed, didn't believe that architecture could actually have the power to do this. And I believe that if we embrace it and believe that we can, um, we'll see change and we are seeing it. Um, and, and we've seen incredible moves um, in the architecture profession. I do think um, just as strongly as it has the power to um, improve lives, it's, it's, it's been used in the opposite, you know, to, to destroy lives, I think. I think people, there are some people that can't even go to certain places because they just don't feel like it's accessible. It doesn't feel like it's a place or a space that, that welcomes them, that even recognizes in any way that they, that they exist from, from the design, from the architecture, from the, you know, um, you know, the, the colonializing and the, you know, it's just, it's just got to be something that um, that we think about, and we think about more and more now. That's only a result of the field of architecture becoming more diverse, and and so that's why you. I'm glad to see 
so many uh, women uh, have entered the profession, have, have really bought that lens. Um, African Americans have brought it, Hispanics, uh, or I'm sorry, Latin Americans have brought that, that lens. So uh, as the profession gets more and more diverse, people are realizing that it is, uh, it is a mandate to use architecture to help address some of these issues. Hmm. Emma? Hi, um, my name's Emma. I'm a current fourth year student. Um, and my question relates a little bit back to what we were talking earlier about um, community involvement, because we as architects know what's happening in the field and what's going on in our discourse and know what to look for and build us, but how do you begin to bridge that gap with the, the public um, to, to tell people like, this is what this building means and what it's for um, is that just with those um, like mentorship programs that I've seen that you've been a part of, or is it something else? Yeah, I, th I think I got the question. I, you you broke <laughs> up a little bit, but I'll I think I I, I understood what you're asking. Um, you know, first of all, I think you know we've kind of moved beyond the helicoptering in architects, at least our practice have, um, and 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 just dropping something. So we we co-create with the community. So they're they're partnered, they're with us so that they have that understanding coming up. The key is finding, you just can't go out on the street and invite a bunch of people in. It's gotta be the right people, the right voices. And, and how, do you, how do you do that? And that goes back to the question, I think I was asked earlier about why these projects take so much time because you have to get the right advocates, the right sponsors um, to really make sure that, that you're talking to the right people in the community, not just the loudest people that show up and talk about everything. That's not who you wanna engage. You wanna to get to those silent voices. So I think that's what you were asking me about. Um, I hope I answered the question because I lost the connection a bit. Yeah, mostly. Um, it was also about you know reaching with um, public schools and with students as well um, yeah. to enter into this field. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you restated that because that, that's really important. Um, right now, uh, we, we call it obviously building the pipeline. And, um, you know, we've had a leaky pipeline with people starting off in the profession then somehow leaving. And so a lot of when you when we go into these schools and we have um, programs in our office like explorers or or go out talking mentoring speaking to young we're, we're trying to reach kids younger at this point to let them know that architecture existed as a profession and to spark that entrance interest early because architecture is is such a long um, kind of path to, to professional um, professionalism so that, that's extraordinarily important for us to, to get them early. It's easy to, to think about just talking to you guys at, high school, at um, college level or even high school level, but really driving back and thinking about um, junior high is, and is where we need to be and even elementary. So um, yeah, very important. Elijah? Uh, hello, I'm Elijah Willis. Uh, I'm a fourth year uh, undergraduate student. And uh, my question to you would be, uh, could you talk more? Did we lose her? Her audio has gone out, Elijah. <laughs> hello, testing. Much better. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All righty. Um, could you talk more about your remembrance design concept for engaging historically underserved communities? Um, we've seen the resurgence of Black Lives Matter protests in many, many cities, including Asheville, North Carolina. Um, there's been a call for reinvestment in historically underinvested communities, large, largely who's African American. Um, so how do you see architects being able to guide these measures? And as a tangent, how do we go about the necessary investment in these communities without gentrification and displacement? That's exactly right. Um, thank you. Um, so I'll start with the latter question first. You know, um, 
gentrification is is largely a a result of economic forces. Um, so we we're not saying that design can you know with is the silver bullet that's going to take care of all of this. What we're trying to do is recognize that some level of gentrification is going to happen anytime you improve a community. Anytime you you particularly if you bring in um, transit orient transit and and hence transit oriented development, that's going to fuel investment in the community, that's going to bring people in. What we're trying to avoid is mass displacement with, with that. And so what we're saying is that there, there are areas um, in the United States that, you know, you can go to certain areas, even in California, that, that, that it's Chinatown, right? But you go there and there's not a lot of Asian or Chinese people that live there, but the place is marked and as Chinatown and people, when they come there, they come there to consume that Chinese culture, not to, with the attitude of bringing a culture there to, dis, to remove the prevailing culture and replace it with their own. So what we're trying to do is say, let's culturally celebrate by, with the built environment, by um, not just architecture, but architecture, art, landscape architects, indigenous architecture, indigenous planning. Let's mark these places as, as um, sort of, um, you know, culturally black space and, and allow people to come there and, and consume it and not, not replace it. So that answers the, the second question. I think your first question, what, can you repeat your first question? Oh, we may have lost your audio again. Hello. Yeah, uh, uh, how do you see architects being able to guide these measures in terms of um, the call for reinvestment in historically underserved communities? That's a good okay, right. So um, the way that the, the call for reinvestment in um, historically underserved communities, first of all, there's work that needs to be done in these communities. Um, I. For example, I was trying to um, a couple years ago engage with the community in um, in uh, Louisiana, who really didn't want it because they, in that African American community, they saw any investment as a risk to to loss and displacing them. So literally, the decision was made to actually hold on to dilapidating structures, uh, streets, and everything, we'd rather hold on to it and not invest in it than have someone, even if, even if it's, it's of, with good intention, come in, invest, and build up that community out of fear of loss. So there's a psychological thing that the African-American communities have to work through to be able to receive investment in those communities. Um, once you kind of get over that barrier, the investment in the communities, it's really being driven by, you know, the, 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 the foundations. There, there is a groundswell of people that recognizes that these communities have been sucked out of, you know, life and, and limb for, for far too long and are willing, we're working with a, an investor, a developer in Miami who is coming in, um, working with the CRA, the Community Redevelopment Authority, to, to really buy up property, invest, um, improve for specific African-American ownership and, and business and entrepreneurship. Those are the type of things and of investments where you work hand in hand with the community that, that's gonna help. So I think I probably have time for one more question, uh, Greer, if, if, if there is another. Sure. Um, Blaine, I don't know if you want to ask one of the questions from the chat, or I think Fernando might have one other question. Yeah, I would, I'd be happy to do that if that's okay. And just to make sure, Sierra, you're, I uh, just want to make sure if you have a question, uh, or if we, if it's okay to go to the chat. You can ask it from the chat. Okay, thanks, Sierra. Yeah. Uh, so Zena, just out of respect for your time, we'll ask one more question as you mentioned. So happy to have you here today. Uh, I will I will try uh, some apologies to, to the uh, folks 
uh, entering comments, I'll try to consolidate a couple. <laughs> uh, so Timothy asked uh, earlier, with starting projects such as these, it seems as though it's, it is absolutely crucial to gain perspective and context. And he talks about uh, recording narratives from people, a variety of uh, processes and approaches. Uh, how do you build these connections and these partnerships? Where do you usually start and what do you look for? And I'm gonna merge it with Carol Bacon's question, if, if that's okay. Uh, how would you suggest architecture firms pursue culturally focused projects like these when they do not have any in their portfolio to offer as project experience? So a little bit of like, how do you, how do you start yeah. with you know, that dimension? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll start with the how do, how do you start portion of that. And um, I can tell you simply uh, because of, I have got burned early. <laughs> like you, you don't start by just having a good heart and thinking you can go in with, with well intentions and go into these communities and, hey, I'm here to grace you with, with my, my talent, my skill, my whatever. Um, it really, really starts by, by finding um, infrastructures that already exist in the community and partnering with key, um, key people in the community that, um, that can help, um, that, that are networked in the community. And so it, it, really is a, it, it really is a process, to be quite honest. So um, for instance, in all of these, um, it, whether it was, uh, there were a couple projects also that I didn't show you. You know, there's a project in, in um, Vancouver a big project that we're working on that started this way where um, they reached out to obviously me in North Carolina um, because they could not uh, sort of communi communication was broken down through that community. They could not um, figure out a way to reach. It was, it was almost like the Hatfields and the Coys. They were just in corners. And um, what they realized is that um, that they were not, uh, they were not, they were trying to gift something to this community. And that's not what the community wants. They want to, to partner with you. They want to, they want to participate. They want to be at the table. And so we had to revamp that whole, that whole thing. And, and now that's much better. Then to the second part of your question, which is, I think it was how can architects, um, architectural firms that have no experience begin to, to get into this work, um, it's really starting very, very small. E even today, um, and any, you know, we take very, very small bespoke projects, you know, you know, we, 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 we start with something that says, this is just curious and interesting and really out of the box, whether it's, it's, it's something that's, you know, we're working on something now for, um, that's, a, that's an installation at the London Biennale, from, so we, we take these kind of interesting, weird, kind of quirky projects. And so you've got to be willing to, to be risk anything, of course, you've heard that that's worth the reward. You have to take a risk from. So you've got to be able to step out and say, you know, I'm going to try something even small, even on what you're doing right now, even if it's the re a renovation of, um, well, I'll give an example from my own, my own history. Um, I started cultural work 100% because I was doing a $5 million renovation, honestly, on a parking garage, an exterior parking garage. And the city wanted to enhance this lobby space. And so I thought, why couldn't we use this lobby space to tell the story of this was a, a particular neighborhood in Pittsburgh or, or a particular area of the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so it starts wherever you are, just start. And then, um, you know, that, that will then kind of lead you to, you know, to understand if you like it uh, to begin with, if you're passionate about it and, under, and then partner, it will lead you to partner with firms like ours. We have a lot, we partner with a lot of firms um, that that learn from us. We love partnering, and um, so that that'll you know kind of get you going. So uh, yeah, I definitely have to go now. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Zena. Thank you. Really appreciate your time. Uh, I'm I'm so deeply inspired by by the excellence and also importance of your work. Yeah. Uh, and really appreciate your time with us today. Thanks for having me and great questions. Thanks. Highlight of my day. <laughs>